Hello, and welcome to episode 240 of The Joy of Coding. My name is Mike Conley. It's so good to have you here. We're going to be hacking on live... What? We're going to be live hacking on Firefox stuff today. Let's get started. Why delay? You know, what's what? why would one delay? Let's get started. Let me transition now to my screen and the agenda. Uh, right, so today is February 10th, 2021. Episode 240, and if you're not familiar with the stream, maybe this is your first time being here, a reminder, no plan survives breakfast. I think I know what I want to do today. I think I know what I want to work on, but things might go horribly wrong. Um, you know, it's this is not going to be a smooth ride, so strap in. This is going to be a bumpy ride, and, and things might go wrong, and we might get stuck and sidetracked, and, and that's all part of the game here. You know, that's part of what we're trying to capture is real software development. I haven't had lunch yet, so uh, uh, my lovely partner, she is going to be uh, presenting me with a bowl of soup that she has prepared. Very, very kind of her to prepare soup for a late lunch uh, while I stream, so I will probably be eating a little bit to keep my blood sugar up, so just so you know, there will be a little bit of eating, and you get some of that high, high uh, fidelity soup sounds maybe in the microphone for you ASMR heads out there, um, but what... Uh, what do I? What am I saying here? Where, where, where am I going with this? Yeah, no plan survives breakfast. It's gonna be a sloppy one, but that's fine. Uh, second thing I want to point out is that the agenda that we're looking at, you have access to it. This is something that you can, you too can have in front of you, so you can click on the links and stuff. So if you are on uh, uh, YouTube, check out the video description for a link. If you're on Air Mozilla, check out the again the video description for a link. And if you're on Twitch, then the actual link is here let me just drop it into the twitch chat uh it is right here episode 240 i'm just going to drop this into the twitch chat and the live hacking channel here you go booyah um and this will get live updated as i update the agenda so you know as as things progress and as we maybe take notes or i add links or something and this sort of slowly sinks then within a couple of minutes the agenda should be up to date um so that's the first thing the second thing is that there is an episode guide so the episode guide is maybe useful for people who want to uh find out what happened during this episode if they're time travelers or they're in the future right now or um they they want to uh they want to know what happened in episode 220 you know, maybe I make reference to another episode and they want to know what happened. So the episode guide can help with that. The episode guide is completely viewer driven, view, viewer contributed, and you yourself can contribute to the episode guide. If you want to add your own notes, addenda, corrections, uh, you know, expand on some point, send me a pull request to the episode guide repository. The episode guide is hosted on GitHub and I will happily merge in your changes. And I have, I believe, one episode in the can to merge in, but I don't want to do that right now. I'm going to focus on this bug I'm working on. I'll, I'll merge in the change later. Um, but thank you to Smurf D who sent in that change. Prolific, I'd say 95% of the contributions for episodes have come from Smurf D. So thank you, Smurf D. Really appreciate it. Um, so what do I want to work on today? Well, as some of you might be aware, there is this effort underway the the project name is called Proton, but effectively we're doing we were working on some of this last week. We're like reorganizing uh, some of our menus. That's what I'm focusing on is reorganizing some of our menus. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing is uh, well, it's this is the old menu. Let me show you how you turn on the new menu. It is under a pref browser Proton, and you have to add this pref because right now is still very much a work in progress. So we will turn the app menu on, and I'm going to restart the browser. Fun fact, if you have a local build of Firefox, uh, there is a restart the browser el uh, item under the file menu. There's also a keyboard shortcut. But if that, that's only available if you've just built it, and it's like a local build. Very handy. Um, this is a version of like this is what we're thinking so far for the uh, for the new app menu. There's a been a bit of a reorganization. Some of the changes have actually gone out ahead. They're going to go out ahead of of the new app menu. So, for example, changes to the bookmark sub menu um, have already shipped ahead, uh, or they're going to go out in eighty seven. Same with the the history. We're changing. Uh, uh, you know, there's a a more tools section that's going to be populated with some of the dev tools. So we're changing some of the dev tools menus, uh, etc. 
Uh, we've reorganized some of the help menu. And what I want to focus on today is something that's probably uh, been annoying people who have turned on the app menu, who have opted in, you, you brave souls who have been dealing with all the churn and stuff in here, um, on Nightly, because one of the items that's missing from this menu is the update banner and you know add on permissions updates uh, that sort of thing so whenever the the browser uh, has an update downloaded in the background and it needs you to restart this little dot will appear on the menu to let you know hey you know I've got an update queued do you want to restart the browser and uh, that's really handy except that when you open the menu if you have the proton app menu enabled uh, oh, thank you very much my super has arrived this is great thank you really appreciate it um, it's potato and leek. It's got lots of pepper. Pepper, 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 as Yusaka Cooking would say. And and it's delicious. It's delicious. We made this at home ourselves a couple of nights ago, and it's delicious. Potato and leek soup, one of my favorites. Um, where was I? So, the, right, there's supposed to be a banner, an item at the top of this menu. If an update is ready to be applied, there are a couple of other states that it can be in. Like if there's an update available, but you need to actually go choose to download it, that sort of thing. But that usually appears at the top of this menu. And everything is working except that, that banner. Like the little alert will show up on the app menu button just fine. But when you open it, there'll be nothing here. Um, thank you. Ooh, I got some bonus, bonus little cheeses. Delightful. I should have eaten lunch beforehand, but I had too many meetings. Um, let's see. What's going on here? So, yeah, we want to have this, like, app menu entry up here, or the, the update thing up there. And there's also another part of it, which is the add-ons uh, permissions updates. So sometimes an add-on will get updated in the background, and it will change its permissions characteristics. And so we have to ask the user, like, hold on. This add-on just changed what permissions it wants. Do you want to grant them? You know, for example... I've got an add-on that um, helps me share. You maybe have seen this before in my toolbar. This like little airplane. This is an add-on called Share Backboard, and it allows me to share a site that I'm on with all of these different services. And in order to do that, it needs to be able to, I think, talk to these services, or at least some of them. And uh, if they were to add a new service, then it would probably prompt me, like, hey, do you want to... Do you want to make sure, do you want this add-on to be able to talk to, you know, newservice.com or whatever? And so you may have seen that banner before, you may have not. But what is definitely true is that with Proton enabled, you don't get any banners whatsoever. And so I want to try and take a run at that today. Uh, Danny Colin asks, are we going to have a new show, Cooking with Mike? You know what? Maybe. Someday. Like, I feel like the pandemic is like the perfect opportunity for me to um, to do that. Um, I, it's not like I have great cooking skills or anything. It'd, it'd be more of a, like, do you want to watch me cook a meal? Um, and I don't know if that'd be enjoyable. Maybe I could tell stories while I do it. The problem is that I don't really have the right setup for it. I feel like when I'm cooking, especially where, where we're living right now, yeah, I have to move around a lot in order to like chop and then cook and stuff. And so you either need a mobile camera crew which would mean like having, I think, I think my partner just like carry a camera around. I wouldn't want to make her do that. Or like strap one to the dog and hope the dog follows me. Or having multiple cameras and being able to switch between them. That sounds like way too much production effort. Um, you know, I'm no binging with Babish. Maybe if I was trying to do a cooking show for a living. Um, maybe for short things though. Like if I made something that only takes like 15 or 20 minutes. Maybe, maybe she'd be willing to follow me around with the camera. Or maybe we could pass the camera back and forth. Because we normally like cook together. Um... But then she'd be on camera, and I, I don't know if... Maybe. Maybe someday. We'll see. Or Mike Eats. Yeah, do you want just a, a show of me, like, testing various foods? Hmm, potato and leek. Let's try this out. Delightful. A+. plus. I'd give it a buy. Uh, let's get started. I'm, I'm talking too much about food. So, I did a little bit of research on how these banners work. The update banners. Well, first of all, there's a bug associated with the work in the agenda, so let's follow that. Um, and I already sort of did a breakdown of what's needed. And what's really nice about this, from my research anyways, is that the code that populates those banners 
is really nicely decoupled from the panel that actually shows the banners. You know, like it's designed such that it seems to be designed such that uh, there doesn't necessarily need to be a whole lot of work to get these banners in. Like, I don't know what they're going to look like, but to actually have the logic to insert the banner and make them show up and, and populate them with the right text, I think it's not going to take a whole lot of work. Honestly, I think the hardest thing is going to be trying to trick the browser into showing me the different panel states because that's how we're going to need to test this. And so, you know, I, th whenever I have a local build, it's not going to download and apply updates from Mozilla Central or anything. So I'm going to need to trick it into thinking there's an update applied uh, or an update pending or all the different states so that it will show me the panel. And that might actually be the hardest part of this. Um, so we're going to get to that at some point. But for now, let's start with, with walking through what I think we need to do. So I already talked about the two different kinds of banners. And I already talked about the fact that there's like this nice decoupling. So we're going to add two items to the top of the Proton app menu as the first child of the panel subview body. And these two items should resemble the items in this, the original, the original panel. They should look a lot like this one. So I'm actually going to copy these wholesale and drop them in to start. Whoops. So let's go into browser.xhtml. We're going to find the Proton app menu. I think it's uh, app menu Proton protection. Where is this? Proton, Proton. App menu Proton main view, right here. As the first, here, let me pump up the font a little. The first child of the panel subview body, we're going to add these two items. Now, the ID is uh, is going to be interesting. Like, I don't want to ever have it possible to have two items with the same ID in the DOM. That's not a good idea. Technically, like, it's not going to explode, but your JavaScript's going to get very uh, confused. Get element by ID, for example, I think is going to default to finding you the first one. Um, and query selector will use like the first one it finds based on what your query selectoring on. Anyways, it's generally a bad idea to have. I think that's like it breaks. It's not going to break the the markup, but it's just a bad practice to have two elements with the same ID. It's like undefined behavior or something. Just don't do it. So we need to update some of these IDs. So for now, um, I'm going to say app menu proton add-on banner and app menu proton update banner. And we can reuse the same classes, these same attributes. This all looks great. We might want to take the opportunity to port some of these to Fluent. Um, and then this, I will have to see whether or not this event is going to do, this event handler is going to do the right thing. But for now, let's let's put these in here. And that was the first step. So the second step is manually check to see if this function is smart enough to choose the app menu Proton update banner. So I guess, um, yeah, I guess we're being really inconsistent about like how we're naming things, dashes or camel case. That's fine. Eventually, we're just going to remove the word Proton when we get rid of the old menu. So these are just placeholders. Um, check to see if this function. So what's this function? Um, what are we talking about here? There's a function called show banner item and then a notification. So this might be a, a way I can test um, the different states is if I can call this function, this sort of hidden function with whatever notification is. I don't know what notification is, so we're going to have to know what that is. Um, it has, it's an object that has an ID property, it looks like. And, and so let's maybe see what calls it. Notifications. Update notifications. Who calls that? Panel UI. And when we observe that, like, at menu notifications changes and it's going to pass in so there's this module called at menu notifications that's useful and so there's this object that can get created with an id an action a secondary action and some optional options <laughs> okay 
So maybe we can just start calling this uh, ourselves to do the testing. Uh, let's let's see who calls at menu notifications, show notification. The update listener and the extensions UI. That makes a lot of sense. Plus, there's like um, a bunch of tests, which is really nice. Looks like we've got tests for both the um, you know, updating of the browser. I don't see any tests necessarily for the extension stuff, but hopefully we'll find some. If not, we might have to file a bug to add them. Uh, let's see here. Let's do the update notification one. And let's see how the tests do it. So you, they're passing in like a main action, which is an object with a callback that just sets a Boolean. So maybe that's enough. Like, let's see what happens if right now I open up the browser console and I type in update manual and I pass in a thing that has callback and just an empty function. Whoops, uh, I did not do that correctly. Callback, colon, there we go. And see, notice I've got, okay, now it's showing me the the the, the notification that uh, you, know, you should do it, this little door hanger, that's nice. I don't see the little update banner, I do see the little button. Uh, if I had Proton disabled, like if I uh, disable Proton, the app menu, and I open up a new window, I think, yeah, we'll see this download a fresh copy of Nightly. So that's what we want showing up. And uh, that uh, that's what we want to see if the, the code that I just wrote, first of all, let me let me put this into my... Uh, into my back pocket. I've got some notes that I'm starting to put together for this. They're in the agenda. There's a link to them. I'm going to start. Uh, I'm just going to drop that in there for reuse. I'm going to restart the browser. Uh, I think I might actually have to mock build. The good news is we can start using our mock watch stuff. This is if I have an artifact build, I do mock build, and I can do mock watch. Oh, uh, Lowell Repeat Lowell asks, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> so if I understand correctly, you're currently working on a restart to update nightly banner in the new app menu, right? Nice. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. This is something that uh, I think our nightly population is going to enjoy. We just haven't had the time to do it. Like, there's a lot to do, and like we're just getting to this part now. Uh, so I'm going to do mock watch so I don't have to keep uh, rebuilding. And then I'm going to... Open up a new window. Uh, sorry, let me pump up the font a little bit. Do, 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 do. Uh, build with artifacts still. And then mock run. And then uh, we're going to try out this chunk of code again and see what happens. It, like, is it going to explode if... Uh, I call it. So I didn't see any exceptions thrown. Uh, notice that the strings are all funky. This is I'm using a different profile right now that's using a, a string diagnostic tool. So please ignore the very strange looking strings. So look, look what we've got here. That was really easy. We've got this banner in here. All we needed to do was add the item. And it looks like um, the app menu panel code is sort of is agnostic enough. It's decoupled enough from the underlying panel to be comfortable doing this, which is really nice. Um, so that feels good. That was very simple. Let's try a different one. So there are a couple of different uh, things you can pass. There's like update manual. Um, Is it just update manual? What are other ones I can pass? Update manual seems to be the one that everyone's favoring here. Update restart. Let's try update restart. So first of all, let me like choose this. What happens? It just goes away. Let me try update restart. It probably goes away because the callback does nothing. So I'm just going to like put in a console log like clicked. Update restart. 
So we get our item there. Restart to update nightly. Click and clicked. Amazing. I love this API. This is very easy. Um, what are the other different messages that we can pass? There's like update manual, update available. Let's do update available. Update available. I think that's similar to update manual, but all right, um, that worked. And then what was the last one? We've done manual, available, restart. Let's do unsupported. So we've got our little warning here. Okay, click on this. You cannot perform further updates. So this can happen if, for example, you are um, running a version of your operating system that we no longer support. So for example, if you're a user on Windows XP, you're gonna see something like this. Cause it's like you can't, updates just are not supporting your operating system or like outdated versions of Mac OS or something. Now that's really hard to see. Uh, you know, that that yellow is really difficult to see, but I think that's actually a pre-existing issue. There should probably be a border or something like white on yellow. I don't know what's going on there. Um, I don't know if that's Proton related. Let's actually just check. Proton. Turn off tabs, turn off menu. Yeah, it's poor contrast. I mean, you can see that there's like a yellow, there's a shape there, but I think this is out of scope. Uh, I'm gonna turn app menu back on. I'm also gonna. I'm getting freaked out by these, uh, by these strings. L ten n pseudo. That's what's causing it. I'm just gonna get rid of that. And I think that accounts for. Like I think that more or less solves the the application update problem. Uh, we should run the tests to be sure. Like we've got browser panel UI notifications that we should run. But I'm I'm pretty happy. Um, let's let's run that right now. Let's run it with the uh, Proton Pref disabled, the app menu Proton Pref disabled, and run it with it enabled and see what happens. So mock, Moki test, that. And while that's running, I'm going to have more of my soup. Okay, still works with Proton disabled. No surprises there. Now let's run it with Proton enabled. And the way you can do that is I believe mock Moki test takes an argument where you can set a pref. Um, set pref. Yeah, that's what I'll use. So set pref. And then what's the format? Uh, set pref is. Oh geez, uh, I lost it. Pref and then value. Pref equals value. Okay, so browser proton app menu dot enabled equals true. So let's run it like that. Amazing, and we were definitely using the Proton app menu there, so feels pretty good. Feels pretty good. I like it when code is like this. You know, it it's very flexible. There was this is what we're experiencing. This joy. Do you feel joy flowing through your veins like I do? What you're experiencing is the result of good forward-thinking engineering work, where there was nice decoupling between the notification system and the panel that shows it, because. You know, someone foresaw, maybe it was instinctual, maybe it was accidental, or maybe they foresaw this, that, you know, the underlying representation might change, you know, periodic rethemes occur, we might decide to redesign the panel. And whoever was designing this mechanism 
made it so that it's really easy for us to just like move this thing around it's not tightly coupled to a particular item and we have to have like a fork somewhere that switches between the two like it's mwah, molto bello uh very happy very happy so let's see what other tests uh we might want to run as well uh let's do full screen browser panel ui notifications full screen You're going to see me run a bunch of tests and eat soup. I hope that's cool. Dennis says, no joy, just envy. Well, Dennis, you... <laughs> yeah. I mean, for everyone who, who may be not familiar with Dennis and his work, Dennis uh, is part of one of the heroes on our web compatibility teams. Our, our web compatibility team. And so Dennis, part of Dennis's job, he's got like a bunch of plates that he spins. But as I understand it, part of Dennis's job is uh, to pick apart what's going wrong with a website. Like why is a website behaving differently in Firefox or, or like a, one browser versus another. And that means digging into highly obfuscated, compressed, you know, um, oh, what happened here? We should figure this one out. Uh, hi, like teasing that apart and trying to like decode what a website is doing so that we can figure out if this is a problem on our side or if we should reach out to the website authors and say, hey, like you should probably do things differently. Um, one of one of the heroic team members who has to like really go into, it's not exactly like reading assembly, but like I think sometimes it's often similar where like they're doing a, a very like, obfuscated line by line reading in very abstract terms of a site that has had its like scripts all munged together with webpack and babel and and like obfuscators and all these sorts of things so it's it's heroic work uh now what went wrong here what did this test fail because of something we did or because it always fails because that's a possibility let's t do a quick check to see what the rules of this test are um yeah, okay, so skip if OS equals Mac. This test is not supposed to run on Mac. And if we were to run the whole suite, we would skip this, but uh, Moki test allows us to run an individual one and ignore this rule, and I didn't know that. So um, this is expected to fail, which, okay, let's move on. Uh, let's do no auto hide toolbar then. Uh, let's check to see if this one is also expected to fail. Skip if we're on verify and we're on Linux or Mac OS for some reason. Okay, well, uh, we're not using verify, so this one shouldn't fail for some reason. Like, it's weird, this is a, another full screen variation, excuse me, but um, but it doesn't skip Mac OS outright, only if we're doing a verify. So it sounds like it's kind of a flaky test. Well, let's Let's run it and see what happens. I'll have more soup before it gets cold. What else can I tell you about this soup? Um, no one asked that. I'm pretending like someone asked. It's got lots of pepper in it. I like black pepper. We tend to add like a little bit of half and half cream to thicken it up and to give it a more richness. Um, we used russet potatoes. So that has a higher starch content. This test appears to just not be moving. I don't know what's going on here. Um, some kind of marionette issue. Let's try that again. What is russet potatoes? Russet potatoes are a type of potato, like Yukon Gold or um, what are other types of potatoes? I think those are like the only two kinds of potatoes I know. Yukon Gold, russet, baked? No, that's not a type of potato. That's a way of preparing them. Um, 
It's a t- it's a species of potato, and um, or a sub subspecies. I don't know what the technical term is. It's a type. It's a, a version of a potato, and they have a high starch content. It's great if you're uh, if you like starch like me. Good for fries for baking. Okay, I don't know what's going wrong here, but I'm gonna add this test to our list of things we need to think about. Um, okay. So, why is such and such failing? Is that our fault or was it always failing? Moving on. And finally, this one is not a full screen test. We're gonna run this. Yeah, half and half in the soup. Um, what else do we do? Uh, periodically in potato and leek, I've been putting sour cream. That's really nice. Um, all right. That passes. Uh, I'm going to try now with the Proton enabled prep. Browser, Proton, app menu, enabled equals true. Um, I've really gotten into soup making, to be honest. Like, that's one of the things that I've, I've really sort of done during the pandemic is really rallied behind my Instant Pot. I have an Instant Pot, which is a really useful appliance for making all sorts of things. And this is not a commercial. I'm not sponsored by Instant Pot. But um, I've been using it to make soups. And I really, like, I've been enjoying it. Oh, Danny, I haven't been checking to see how, how it looks. But yeah, Danny Colon says that the soup just kind of, like, disappears. Like, I'm eating... Yeah, like I'm eating, like, terminal. <laughs> because of it's green. It's kind of green colored, I guess. And so I'm eating... I'm eating characters from my terminal. Delicious. I guess if I were to spill it all over my front, maybe it would look like suddenly there was a hole on me. I don't know if it's that thick. All right, well, that's good. It passed whenever I ran it with the pref enabled. I'm feeling more and more confident about this. Um... Let's see if there are any other calls to show notific app menu notifications in tests. Um, in our test code. Hmm. FXA badge. We already ran these. Search tips. Did we run this one, panel UI notifications? I think we did. Let me just double check. Panel UI notifications. Yes, we definitely did. And it all seemed to work out. There's one for private browsing. Ah, this one looks like it's going to, uh, it's going to exercise some of our add-on ones. So that's kind of interesting. Add-on installed. Let's let's see what that looks like. This one I actually think is going to require more work. Like if we go back to our list here, um, I think we can now be reasonably certain that the function that I pointed at before is smart enough to differentiate between the proton menu and the non-proton menu. Like I'm confident of that now, and I that was my uh, sort of a suspicion before because um, it's using like query selector on the main view, and we're just like it's looking for a class, not an ID. Like it's it's really nice. Um, we are going to have to update this chunk of code. This chunk of code is using I an ID, and this we're going to have to fork. Uh, thankfully, uh, this is running inside of panel UI.js, which already knows whether or not we're running uh, we're running with Proton app menu enabled. So this should be reasonably straightforward. So let, this is for just the add-on notification part. Let's do that work right now. Panel UI.js. Uh, and this is a function called add on notification container. And so what I'm thinking of doing, it doesn't have to be fancy because this is only needs to last us for the until like proton ships and then we can get rid of all of the branching. But effectively we're going to add a branch here. I'm going to say um, let uh, banner ID equal um, this dot I think it's proton app menu enabled question mark if it's enabled it's called uh, app menu proton add-on 
banners. Otherwise, it's called app menu add-on banners. And yes, I could have done something a little fancy here to like inject proton and another dash automatically instead of just like defining these two strings that has a little bit of repetition. But again, you have to like, is it worth it? Is it worth that deduplication? Probably not. Um, like we're just gonna be removing this once Proton ships anyways. So this is more of like a shim until, you know, it's out the door and then we can get rid of this stuff. And what's really nice about it is because it's all using the same property, we can just look for all the places where we're branching and then eliminate the non-enabled branch when it comes time to clean everything up. So this looks like a lazy getter where if the container isn't identified, isn't, hasn't been gotten in the past, then we will get it and then we will memoize it. So we will return it next time. Okay. So that looks good. Uh, we don't need to build because of mock watch. What we do need to do is maybe run some of these add-on tests. Um, what are the ones we found? What are the ones we found? What you think? Add-on installed. Now, who actually does this? Add-on notification container. Who calls this? In browser add-ons. Create add-on button. Also here in update alerts for side-loaded add-ons, create add-on button. Okay, so I'm gonna to wanna to test both of these cases. Is it just these two? Update alerts, create add-on button. Yeah, it's just these two. And are there anything else, is there anything else that calls into notification container that's not a test? Well, this one, no, it's not. It's just this one place. Okay, feeling feeling good, feeling, feeling good. So let's, uh, let's try and simulate an add-on being sideloaded or an add-on changing its permissions. I'm eating these crackers and I'm also having soup. My sodium intake is like, my sodium intake for the day is at, is done. Hmm. Looks like we've already got tests for this. That's great. Maybe we can just run this and see what happens. Um, let's uh, mock Moki test. Let's just run it without the pref enabled and see what happens. I love this. This is like very relaxed. It's like I'm just. I'm just riding a train. I'm on rails here. Uh, all right, that passed nicely. Set pref, browser, proton, app menu, enable is true. Now we have to pay attention here because it's gonna move quickly, but we're gonna looking for the little alert showing up in the app menu. Yes, I see it, I see it, and it passed. Folks. We're in really good shape here. This stuff looks good. I think it's gonna work. Um, I'm really pleased. This is turning out to be very straightforward. Um, and now, well, okay, so this is interesting. We're gonna do some styling work for the banner. Um, at least for the update banner, for the one that's green. Um, well, we know that the banners all should have a border radius of four. They should all have internal padding of eight. The banner should have eight pixels of margin space between itself and other items above or below. And that the background color of like the green update banner should be this color. That's what we know. Um, let's see if we can make that look right. 
And then what I want to do is I want to push this to try and work on other things. Like I've got a long review queue, but uh, if we can kind of make this look right, then I think we're in good shape. And push it to try and then, you know, we'll see how we're going. But like, look how much code that, that was required of us. Like, it, it's so little. I love it. I love it. And we're, we're like, the functionality seems to be there. So I'm going to do a commit right now. Uh, bug this. Um, port the uh, update and add on banner. Uh, the What are they called? The add on and browser update banners to the Proton app menu. Who's going to review this? Who's going to review this? Let's see how Molly feels about reviewing this. Um, and now uh, let's work on the let's work on the style the styling. Oh, I didn't need to do mock build faster. I keep forgetting that like mock build faster is not necessary because mock watch is running in the background and it's an artifact build. I keep forgetting. Okay. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to open up old, uh, old browser here. And I'm going to open up the dev tools, the browser toolbox. We don't have the browser toolbox listed yet in the app menu. The dev tools are coming. But for now, we're going to bring this up. We're going to run the, uh, the command that makes the update thing show up. Let's say update manual. So we've got our little panel here. I'm going to change focus. All right, so we've got this. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the meatballs here in the browser toolbox and say disable pop-up auto hide. So we have a good look at our, our banner, and we can start inspecting it and picking it apart a little bit and applying some styles. Um, so like right away, I can I can see what it's uh what oh, not disabled or hover it's interesting like there's a hover rule panel banner item color is black this rule is applied i'm not hovering it it is focused maybe that's why if i were to focus something else Hmm. Wonder why that rule is applying. Oh yeah, now it's not it's not applying anymore. Um, background color is this like different one. Let me slide in the color from the bug and see what that looks like. Okay, got it. And panel ban banner items, uh, they've got their like padding and stuff here. They got a border. Uh, I don't think what we want has a border anymore. Oh, this is interesting. Add on banner item and panel banner item. This is, I think, where all the magic's going to happen. So, for example, we have a, our border radius set, and we want to have the border radius of four pixels. So, we can do that here probably and it would apply to both so four pixels and we want to make sure that uh, the banner should have uh, internal padding of eight pixels internal padding eight pixels um, and the banner should have eight pixels of margin space on either side now this thing did just reflow and change itself, but like that's because it doesn't know, it didn't know it's like, um, uh, it's it didn't know its dimensions. When like the the panel adjusted to the, it wouldn't, it, it's not gonna look like this. It's not gonna have the scroll bar. So relax. Uh, there's a min height set that's interesting. Appearance none, box shadow none, transition on the border color or the background color. Really? We're doing a transition on the background color, eh? I don't know if we need that.
And then padding inline start. Don't need that. Probably don't need the border. And we don't need the icon. Um, now, why is the text indented still? L to N to our atchers. Oh, that's so lovely. Now I'm getting tea. This is crazy. Uh, th what what service? Thank you so much. Um, I see toolbar button icon. So there's a rule here where the width of the even if there's no uh, image displayed, we'll show that. Um, and then the button text. So not exactly what we're looking for just yet. Like notice that there's like, it's it's actually closer uh, to the final product than these other menu items. These other menu items have way too much like left margin. Um, we're hoping that I think everything's gonna have like eight pixels difference to the edge of the highlight and then eight pixels difference to the first character. And we haven't done that yet. Um, let's look at the label here. What's what's your you've got five, you got padding on yourself. Why do you have padding on yourself? It's no padding. That's better. Okay. Now the actual hover color. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be, so I won't set it just yet. Um, I'll look that up later. I'll talk to someone from UX, but it's starting to look it's starting to look better. Um, Lowell repeat Lowell says, I like how that looks so far. Yeah. Smurf D says that they are relaxed. Oh, well, good. That's, I like it. If you're relaxed, I'm relaxed. A relaxed audience means a relaxed performer and vice versa. Everyone's relaxed. You know, hey, I encourage you, if you're hungry and you've got soup and you're not sure what to eat, grab that soup. Have some soup with me. Welcome to the joy of soup. Um, you're welcome to join me in soup consumption. All right, so we're in pretty good shape here. Um, I think, you know, I've been tinkering around here in the in the rules. I think we can start actually uh, updating some CSS now. Now, what we want to do, what's kind of special about what we're doing here, is we only want these stylistic rules to change if Proton is enabled, and that used to be really difficult or it wasn't straightforward. You'd have to like read a pref and then like set an attribute on a node and then write your CSS so that you like match that attribute. And that could result in like very complicated um, CSS rules depending on like where you put that attribute. Thankfully, uh, our platform engineers did a great job of making it easier for us to use prefs within our CSS. And I will show you how that works. Um, let's start by taking a peek at what we just did. We, the big one that I think is most important is this whole bank of rules right here. Because it applies both to the add-on banner item and the panel banner item. And we like, we updated the border radius um, and the margin in the padding. So let's find out where this rule is. So we're inside of a file called panel UI CSS and we're looking for these rules. Okay. So let's let's use search fox and find out where it actually is in the source. Smurf D has a link to a family guy clip, I think. Feel free to check that out. I'm not going to I'm not going to view it mainly because I don't want like I've gotten a couple of um, knuckle wraps from YouTube for having like certain things in my videos like I think a couple of weeks ago we were doing some picture in picture stuff and I had like a couple of frames from like a couple of seconds from a Jane's Addiction music video and then YouTube was like, "Hey, there's been a copyright notice on your video and you are you are a bad person." Like stuff like that. Um you can't if you ever decide to make money on this, you can't. Not that I I'm not, I'm not doing this to make money, but I'd rather not show I'd rather not get those messages. Okay, so we're inside a file called panelui.inc.css on line 580. 
and that's where we're going to go. Now, why is it ink.css? It's because it's an included CSS file. Now, our preprocessor will in in inject this into some of our other CSS. And, like, that's a way so that we can have, like, common CSS between platforms, not have to repeat ourselves so much. So what I want to do here is I want to have, like, very Proton-specific rules here for these items. What I'm going to do, uh, let me show you how that works. I don't know if we have any in here yet. Yes, we do. Um, so if I go back down here, I'm going to create this this uh, supports rule that says, like, hey, supports. If you have this Boolean pref set to true, browser Proton app menu enabled, then do these rules. And that's very handy. So now I can start overriding these things. And if you don't have Proton enabled, then you just like none of these rules get applied. So it'll be like uh, eight pixels of margin, I believe. Um, and then padding, eight pixels of padding. And I don't know if we need that min height. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna just unset the min height. Uh, a lot of these we will just inherit from the previous rule. Border radius, four pixels. Um, just inherit that. All right. There's an, a couple of other things here. Uh, Panel, banner item, toolbar, button icon. It's a cropping solution for Flexbox. App menu, add on banners, add on banner item. I think what I want to do overlap the add on banner item board so there's one border. Interesting. That might be an interesting thing here that we're gonna have to deal with. Panel, banner item, border block, uh, padding inline start. We might wanna only do any of these rules if Proton is not enabled. And so the way you do that is you say supports not at menu enabled, and then we'll do these things. And I think we've got a convention here where we'll go like end proton. Um, uh, capital P. And then down here it'll be like end not proton. All right. Let's just see what that looks like. I'm going to turn off meatball, disable auto hide. We're going to go back. We don't have the color set or anything, but let's restart and take a look. Danny Colin asks, does it also work with string and number prefs? Which part? Oh, oh, the CSS. No, uh, no, it does not. It's just for Booleans. Um, we haven't had the occasion. We haven't needed strings or numbers yet. It's just for Booleans, which is really handy for like just turning stuff on and off. But it would be nice down the line if we could have you know, like strings and Booleans for more fine grained preferences. I hear you. All right, let's do that again. Let's take a look at what this looks like. All right, so we're we're in pretty good shape here. We got our uh, update uh, update item here looking okay, looking like it kind of fits in. Um, now we got to get rid of that icon. We don't want the icon anymore. Um, I gotta find the rule where that icon is set and get rid of it. Here it is panel UI and it looks like this, uh, branding something, something. <clears throat> I don't know where that's defined, but maybe I'll look for this rule. Okay, let's ask, ask search fox. It knows where everything is. What? 
Seriously? It's right here, yo. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of interesting rules in here that we might have to turn off depending on whether or not Proton's enabled. The badge. Hmm. I think I'm going to leave those for now. Those are all about the icon. Oh, no, it's more about the, the menu button itself. Not, not, and so we're going to leave that for sure. The banner item, this is about the icon. Let's leave that for now because I don't know what we're doing with the icon just yet. It's possible that the icon is actually going to move from here to the left. I think that I've seen I've seen talk of that. But for now, let's get rid of this um, uh, supports mozbool pref. Oh man, I've already forgotten how this works. Uh, mozbool pref. And not proton. Okay, and that will get rid of our icon, I believe. And are there any other list style image things in here? Hmm. Maybe in here. background color here's our here's our uh, hover and focus colors we don't know what the hover and focus and active colors are um, so what are we gonna do here um, Panel, banner, item, background color. We're going to give it a different color. We're going to give it the, the old, this color, RGBA. And that might actually be a color that we want to give a variable to, but I'll do that later. And the Moz bool pref thing again. Where are we? 1061. And we don't know what the hover focus or active colors are, so we'll just leave those be. All right, let's take a look. It's in a book. Reading Rainbow. Dan Colon says, yep, I currently use it to change stuff in my user Chrome on my Pine phone, so the Firefox UI fits a bit better on a small screen. Cool. I've never actually seen a Pine phone. I've seen screenshots. Um, those are relatively new, I think, right? I haven't gotten my hands on one yet. Even just to check it out. Okay. All right. Looking, looking okay. Uh, I don't know what the add-on ones look like. Let's see if we can get a sense of what those look like. Um, actually, hold on. Before I do that, let's look at some of the other colors or the other messages. Update manual, update unsupported. Okay, and what's another one? Um, update restart. Yep, and then update, what was the last one? Update manual unsupported restart available. Cool. All right. So this will at least give us 
the beginnings. Um, you know, we're going to need to do a little bit of polish, I think, on the CSS. But this gives us the beginnings. It gives us the functionality. Uh, let's see if we can see what these add-on banners look like uh, with these rules that we've just done. Uh, update alerts. Uh, get format string web experiments and text. So if I call what is this function called? Our G extension notifications. So there should be something in the global scope called that. Yes, there is, and there's an private method that I'm just going to poke into called create add-on button that takes text icon and callback. Now icon, I don't know what URL I'm going to give it. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it the nightly icon um, that we disabled temporarily here. Um, or SVG. this one yeah I'll just give it this one okay so G extension notifications what was it called create add-on button and then I'm gonna say text uh, flibbity flobbity floop uh, icon callback all right, what does this look like? All right, now it's got an icon. It actually has the icon still there. We should probably, um, I don't know what to do about that. Because it might be important to be able to show the user the icon of the add-on that's causing this. I need to talk to UX about that. But that works, you know, and it's not bad. There are certainly some rough edges, but, uh, you know, the CSS for this menu is going to get sorted out in the next couple of days, I think. Someone's already working on cleaning up a lot of the panel CSS. So this is just to get our feet in the water a little bit and uh, to get the functionality that we need. So I think we're actually um, we're in good shape. So I'm going to... I'm going to commit or amend my commit. And you know what? I tagged Molly for review, and Molly might want to review this, but there's also this person who's also working on the CSS for the panel. I wonder if she wants to take a look at it. Just so, at the very least, you should, should be aware of it. Erica's working on the CSS for the panel. And um, that way, you know... I don't su surprise her with like some of the changes that I'm doing in here. So let's take a look at this patch entirely. Like it's really minimal. You know, we added those two elements. Um, we added this little fork here. We updated some CSS. Not bad. Not bad at all. Um, let us push to try and see what explodes. So I'm going to say mock try auto artifact. So pushing to try. I'm not sure if this thing is, I've given it my SSH uh, credentials yet, so it might explode on me. Unlike my soup, which did not explode on me. I got it all down without spilling it on myself, which would have been super embarrassing, but probably good, good, uh, would have made good TV. I don't know what Mercurial's doing here. Like, Okay, here we go. It's just pushing. All right, so that worked out. Hey, so we're going to get some data back on whether or not um, I've got any tests I need to update. But this looks like it's re pretty reasonable so far. We're going to get the functionality into Nightly in the next day or so. 
so that users can more easily update their browser on nightly if they have the Proton app menu enabled. Um, I should, you know, before I forget, I should probably just run a quick check to see what it looks like if Proton is disabled. Make sure I didn't regress anything. That's really important. Okay, so like update available. Yeah, that looks right. And then um, what was the other thing? I just did it for the um, browser toolbox. So in here, yeah, flibbity flobbity floop. Yep, that looks, I guess that looks right. Mm -hmm. All right. Feeling good, feeling good. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna wait for that try build to come back and then I'll get that up for review and then hopefully our nightly users will be able to like more easily update and that'll be good. We got, we got some time left. That did not take long. Like there's still the review stage and stuff, but before we go, uh, maybe we can review some code. That might find, that might be interesting. I've got a lot of patches in my review queue. A bunch just showed up last night from one of my colleagues, Marcus Stanga, who um, is trying to fix, um, basically refactor a, a bunch of code that I contributed to not that long ago, and uh, he's really cleaning it up, which is nice. Um, I've also got these other two patches I should probably review as well from yesterday. Which one do I want to review? Let's actually review this one before we go. So this is for the Fission project. This is unrelated to Proton. This is this has to do with what we do whenever a subframe crashes. So just as a reminder, uh, the Fission project is for when we load subframes, like iframes, that are in third from third parties. So for example, if you are embedding a YouTube su uh, subframe iframe on your website, which I think you do if you're embedding a YouTube video, um, that is a third-party iframe. We would run that in a separate content process from the one that from the hosting frame. And uh, if you want to know more about the Fission project, project, there's plenty of documentation. Like if you look at uh, Mozilla Wiki Fission, just like read this, read this. I'm gonna put this in the agenda. Um, Fission about fission and sync let's just make sure that that works i will always i'm still like antsy that like my updater stuff works see like it's not working just yet why didn't it work oh i know why because there's like a 30 second or to one minute delay and i'm too excited that's why uh anyways uh the patch that is up for review for me is about how we deal with crashes, because now that you have those subframes running in a different process, those processes can crash for a variety of reasons. You know, we decide that it's gone evil and we just destroy it. Uh, so we crash it ourselves. We, um, we run out of memory. Content process crashes. Something external, the operating system, you, you, you yourself, the user, and a security piece of software decides to kill the process. There's all sorts of reasons why a subframe might crash. And what do we do in that case? And so um, what we're doing right now is like when a, ta when a tab crashes, we show like a message, the whole thing's gone away. And so we show this like message that kind of looks like this. Yeah, your tab just crashed. And like there's a form if we were able to get a, a crash report. And uh, when a subframe crashes, we don't really know whether or not that subframe was visible. It may have been like a really innocuous, it could have been like a one by one pixel subframe. And instead of doing the work of figuring out the visibility, what we're doing is we're going to show a notification bar at the top. And uh, But if there's no crash report, if we couldn't generate a crash report, we're just not going to show the notification bar. That's what this bug's all about. And it's a little tricky. You like That sounds simple on the face of it, but it's tricky because we don't know if... like There's a delay between the crash and whether or not a crash report gets generated. So the crash occurs period of time and then either a crash report got generated or it didn't and 
uh, that's when we have to decide whether or not we're going to show the notification bar. And unfortunately, those two points, the, you know, the crash occurs and the notification, like the, the, dump, the, the report gets created or not, they have two pieces of the information that we need. The first point, the part where the crash occurs, tells us where, like which tab, which frame it occurred in. And then the last one is just a general message about the content process and said, this crashed content process, we were able to generate a crash report or we did not. So we actually have to, we have to like remember some information at the first step. And then when the second step happens, we have to like review and say like, okay, well, if a crash report did get created, we have to go back and think about and remember the one, like where the crashes occurred and show the notification bar there. And that's what this patch is about. And the way uh, the, the, the author, Neil, is doing it is by having this map of pending subframe crashes. And right now it's a map, it's not a weak map because we're keying on the ID of the content process that crashed because that's that's the relationship between these two points. Like they both, the, the common piece of information is the unique ID of the content process that crashed. So we have this map and the uh, uh, this is the second stage right here. Let's go to the first stage. So when the subframe crash occurs, Really nice documentation here. Really loving this. Thank you, Neil. Called when a subframe crashes. If the dump is available, shows a subframe crash notification. Otherwise, waits for one to be available. Because it's true. There is no guarantee that the event that... Like, I, I, I made it seem really um, straightforward. Point one occurs, then point two occurs. But they don't necessarily have to happen that, in that order. Especially if you have many, many different tabs all running in that same content process. Because of the way that the event loop works, the information about whether or not a crash dump was created could occur while we're still processing the events of all the you know, like tabs that crashed or frames that crashed. So we have to also be able to um, determine whether or not a crash had a crash report had been created in the past for the crash that just occurred. It's like a there are two parts to it, two variations. If the dump is available, shows a subframe crash notification, otherwise waits for one to be available. So the browser containing the frame that just crashed and the ID of the process that just crashed. That's the key information. And we should we should we should include the type number. Um so if the crash reporter is not enabled, none of this is even necessary. So we just return right away, makes sense. We see if there is a pre-existing dump. If so, then we'll show the notification bar. Otherwise, oh, this is interesting. We're doing a timeout here for something. ID item if item what is this timeout for I don't know what this timeout is for it's for I don't know what this four second timeout is for we wait a few seconds to see if a crash report becomes available if not don't show the notification I see. We give ourselves a, a four-second window to see if a crash report becomes available. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Smurf D is like, read the comment. You're right. You're right. Uh, I see. All right. Four seconds seems really arbitrary. I don't know, that makes me feel uncomfortable, this timeout. <sighs> Could we do this differently? So we get any pending subframe crashes, if they exist. And if they do, then we set up a timer so that in four seconds, we hold item in the closure, we see if the browser's in the collection, if so, we're setting the key and the value. Browser. 
non-deterministic get weak map keys for the items. We go through the browsers. If browsers and not browsers length. Hmm. I don't know about this. All right, I'm going to have to think about this a bit more. I don't think I can. Is there a better way of doing this? Originally, I had suggested to Neil to use non-deterministic get weak map keys, but I didn't think he would use it this way. This isn't what I was suggesting right off the bat. Maybe I, there might be a, um, a case I'm not considering. And what about this block? So we find out whether or not we have a a child map. And if so, We find here we find out whether or not we've got an actual crash report. You know, we enter this branch if we, we've got one, and we check to see if there are any pending subframe crashes. And if so, then we iterate the browsers of the weak map keys, and we make sure that the browser's connected, and we show the notification. Otherwise, and then when we're done, we delete. We delete the children. So this doesn't actually just, this doesn't wait four seconds to show an item. It uses four seconds to delete. Oh, to delete. So the way it's currently set up, we see the crashes occur, period of time passes, observer notification fires to tell us whether or not we have a crash report. Meanwhile, for each of these, a four second timer has been started. If the four second timer expires before the crash dump is made available, which it could, then we're going to delete the pending crash frames and just assume we ran out of time. We're assuming that no crash reports forthcoming. Yeah, I don't I don't know, that doesn't make me feel good. On fast machines, that 4 second window will be enough, but on slower machines not so much. Hmm. Yeah, this timer this timer makes me a bit antsy. It seems like what he's trying to do, and I should probably talk to him about this, is he's trying to clean up. He's saying like, oh, four seconds have passed, didn't see a crash report, and he's got this condition in here. I'm the last one. That's what this is all about. I'm the last one. And a no crash report is still like, um, wait. If I'm the last one, 
then I don't care anymore. Get rid of the child ID. Mapping. It's a cleanup. I guess that's in the event that no dump shows up. That's what he's worried about. No dump showing up. If that's the case, what I would suggest is that, like, you clean up here. In the event that there's no dump ID, then you get rid of the child ID here. You say, like, pending subframe crashes, delete. And then over here, I guess the problem is that subsequent subframe crashes might show up. Okay. That's what he's dealing with. It's that the potential for out of order. Shoot. All right. Is there a cleaner way of doing this that doesn't involve a timer? We already deal with this issue elsewhere, I think. Let me take a look inside of content crash handlers. Sorry, I kind of spaced out there for a second because I was just thinking. But like, I think there's like a rotation. Max unseen child IDs. The elements will only be removed if the tab crash page, however, might be fire process which will never show the tab crash page. For example, the thumbnailing process. Another case to consider is the user's configured to submit backlog crash reports. So I'm trying to account for all these cases. We prevent this list from getting too large by putting in a reasonable upper limit on how many child IDs we track. It's unlikely that this array would ever get so large as to be unwieldy. That's a lot of crashes, but a leak is a leak. Flush crashed browser queue. This should be called once a content process is finished shutting down abnormally. Any tab browser browsers that were selected at the time of the crash will then be sent to the crashed tab page. So full of potatoes and potassium. Yeah, we left the skins on. No, did we leave the skins on? Did we leave the skins on the potatoes? You, no, we shaved the skins off, so less potassium. But there is still potassium in there, I think. Um, definitely sodium though. So one thing to consider, uh, you know, and like, what is this mapping? Pending subframe crashes. That's what all this timer is about. It's a mapping of a child ID to a weak map of browsers. Really should be a browser weak set, but okay. Like I think he's trying, he's effectively using a browser weak map as a set. So that'd be my first suggestion is like, let's create a browser weak set for this. And I think he's trying to clean this up. This is a map. So, it never came, so we want to throw out the set. The set timeout worries me for some reason. Can't really, uh, it, in particular, the non determinic the non deterministic get weak map keys might return a 
non-empty array even though the items in there are just about to be GC'd. So we, we run the risk of uh, leaking the browser weak map object anyways. But I think I see what you're doing. You're, I think you're trying to ensure that the pending subframe crashes mapping from child ID to to browser weak map never uh, eventually gets cleared gets cleared even if a cra even if um, a dump for the case where a dump crash report doesn't get created and the case where the on subframe crash event is handled after the observer notification fires. Is that correct? If so, I have an alternative selection, it's an alternative suggestion that might make this easier and avoid the set timeout, set timeout one. Yeah, I hate to make him because I already gave some feedback on this. Uh, and so but I didn't realize he, he there was this case. Um, so I'm going to apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hadn't considered this scenario in my last review. Uh, I had forgotten it existed. I'm going to put this apology right here. Uh, so what is my idea? Have pending subframe crashes be an array. And have a hard-coded limit on how many elements can be that array. We do something similar with... Um, max unseen crash child IDs but in this so pick a small number pick, pick a smallish number say 5 or 10 and that's the maximum number of entries we'd hold in the pending subframe crashes array that array would be or is it an array? What do we want in there? Do we want an array? A map doesn't have... Oh boy. Pending subframe crash is and pending subframe crash IDs have a new subframe crash IDs be an array and have a hard code limit crash IDs. Um when a when a when the crash uh, observer when the content crash observer notification fires append the child ID to the array if the array is greater than your the element limit is greater than the element limit 
then uh, shift off the front of the array and clear that entry from pending subframe crash and clear that uh, clear that ID from your pending subframe crashes map. We might also want to add a browser weak map implementation here uh, rather than uh, weak set implementation here rather than reusing browser weak map as a set. Um, I actually think that no. am I missing a case here or some nuance okay so I'm going to submit changes requested with apologies to Neil I know I already re reviewed it once um all right I think I'm gonna cap it here hey thanks everybody for watching episode 240 of the joy of coding I hope that was interesting we uh, we you know made really swift progress on that like add-on update banner and browser update banner stuff started to dip our toes into the styling work um, We'll see how that goes. Uh, you know, more styling work is coming this week. Hopefully we can have it all kind of wrapped up by next week. That's when we're hoping to have the menu more or less like stable and done. And, uh, and we'll see. We'll see. So uh, thank you so much for watching episode 240 of The Joy of Coding. Uh, let me know what you thought. There's a link in the agenda to rate the episode. So if you, let, let's go back to the agenda here. Let's see if it got, yeah, the about vision link got added. Click on this link. It says rate this episode. You can fill in this form and you can let me know what you thought of this episode. And there's even a section at the bottom where if you've got any questions that I should try and answer, I didn't get any last episode, but if you have any questions I should try answering during the ne next episode, submit them here. I'll do my best to try and answer them. If I have answers, I'll, I'll try and give them. Um, and let me know what you think. Uh, let me tell me about your favorite soup recipes. Uh, submit information. Uh, you know, I use it to try and make the stream better. And I think that's it. So thanks again for watching. Uh, I'll be back next week with episode 241. Stay safe out there. Uh, and I'll talk to you soon, everybody. That's it. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. I'm just going to run out of steam. So uh, see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya.